We're glad that you've joined us this morning to come and worship with us, and it's a blessing for us to have you with us. Know that we pray for you and ask God to bless you and to watch you in your life and to comfort you. In our sermon today, we took take a look at how God does love us and how he cares about us and the love that he has for us. We just see what God's desire is for us in our life. And I think for some of you, you will be surprised at just how God does love us. Our scripture today comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In our scripture today, Paul is writing to a church that he had worked tirelessly for two years to establish. He begins by praying for them that every Christian there would come to know the power of God. For when we begin to understand who our God is, we can't help but experience the peace of God that comes with that. That understanding comes in different ways to us. Sometimes it comes as we sit back and look at the blessings that God has given to us and just become very thankful. But more often it comes in the midst of trials and difficulties, in the midst of temptation in our life, when we see how God delivers us from those. Both of those are meant to be faith-building experiences in our lives. And they're allowed to come into our life to allow us to grow our reliance upon him. Paul doesn't only tell this church at Ephesus what he's asking for God, but he describes how he is doing it. He is praying on his knees. It is believed that as Paul wrote this letter to the church, that he was under house arrest and that he was himself facing some difficult circumstances. And being a Jew and a Pharisee, the typical way for a Jew to pray would be to stand up and raise their hands to God and to pray. But Paul says he's not praying that way. This is no ordinary prayer. Paul is on his hands and his knees praying in the same manner that our Lord prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed to his heavenly Father. Kneeling is not easy for me anymore. I used to, when I first came to this church, would nearly every Sunday get on my knees and pray, particularly, particularly as we were praying together the liturgy. But with two knee replacements, I don't do that easily anymore. But I know that God knows when our head is bowed and our heart is bowed and we are before him and he understands our posture is one of love and respect to him. We understand that it's fine to talk to God as a friend, to tell him our needs and our trials and our troubles, but there are times in our life when we need to bow before God to understand that he is the one who we are taking our concerns to, telling him the things that we're struggling with in life, 
Not just telling him as we would tell someone who would listen, but telling and speaking to him as our God, who loves us and who knows our problems before we even had them, and who cares about us, that he may help us deal with what comes in our life, and that he may let us overcome our problems. Paul was concerned about this imprisonment that he was facing, and he was looking down the road and he wondered what would happen if his ultimate punishment came about. He was concerned that it would discourage this church who he had been very close to, who he had kept in touch with and encouraged every chance he could. He wondered what would happen then when he could no longer do that. So he did the greatest thing he could for them. He prayed for them. And he wrote them and told them about this and he encouraged them and told them what he had asked God to do for them. First, he asked God to give them inward power. Next, he asked that they would feel the inward presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Then he asked them to be granted an inward perception, to know what God desired for them and what God wanted for them. And then finally, he asked for an inward provision Paul himself knew full well the power of the Holy Spirit. He felt it within himself. And then he prayed that the Christians at this church might be given that same power, that they might serve the Lord and feel his presence in their lives. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you have a sense of peace and confidence in your life that can only come from above. Your circumstances don't define your situation, God does. You feel his direction leading you and you feel secure in that. The way you view the world changes because you understand that God is in control and that you are a child of God. You're not without help and you're not without power. You have both through the Lord who loves you. And then you have an inward provision that God knows your needs and that he's not surprised by any of them. And you feel the burdens that you felt in life and the worry that you may have had about the future lifted from you because you're giving it to God and you're feeling secure in his presence in your life. He has delivered us before. There's no reason to believe that he will not deliver us again. That's the joy of a Christian, the trust in God, that he has been faithful and we can mark that in our lives and we have reason to believe that he will again. Having said that, and having spoken of the supremacy of God and his ability to meet our needs, it would be meaningless if we didn't understand as well how much God loves us. I'm not speaking about a broad form of love that God loves the world. He does, but I'm speaking about a personal love that God has for you, that he knows you by your name and you're precious to him. Your relationship back and forth with him, your prayers, your turning to him, it is special not only to you, but to God. Paul wrote to this church because he wanted them to know and to comprehend what he said was the width and length and depth and the height of God's love. He said that I want you to know that God's love for you is greater than you can even comprehend. You can't imagine how much God loves you. You can't imagine how much that you mean to him. And he, I like these terms because he uses them to describe and quantify that love. He says, I want you to know the width and the length and the, the height of God's love for you. He's describing the abundance of God's love in human terms. It would be like me telling you the measurements of this sanctuary. 
that you can look around and see. It's not just something that you imagine, but you can look and see that you're covered in the love of God. And that's what God is wanting us to understand, that he surrounds us with his love. And it remains with us as long as we live on this earth. And then when our days are done, he takes us to eternity to be in the place that God has created for us. What a blessing. What a gift. Paul said, I want you to know this along with all the saints. I want you to understand what you have in your faith in Christ. I think sometimes we ignore that or we don't trust it. And the struggles of this world become to mount on top of us. But God says, that's not my will for you. I want you to live a life knowing that I love you and knowing that I'm watching over you and I'm supplying you with what you need to deal with life in this world. I want you to understand that God is calling us to share this love with a world that needs it. A world where hype is everywhere and where hope is scarce. So many people in this world are chasing things that they believe will bring happiness to them. They're driving cars that they believe are prestigious. They're living in homes that they can barely afford. They hear advertisements for things that they think are bigger and better and faster and prettier that in a matter of time will be changed and be replaced by things that are bigger and prettier and faster and larger still. They do not last. But we believe we've been sold the bill of goods that we just can't live and be happy in life without them. When the truth is, is what most people really long for is to know in their hearts that someone loves them. What would fulfill them is to believe that they make a difference in someone's life. They need to know that they have purpose and meaning in this life. And we do. We are loved by the King of Kings. We are called to serve him and be his emissaries in this world. He has given to us that responsibility. He has trusted us with that. He knows our faults, our shortcomings, our mistakes, and he loves us anyway, and he trusts us with his work still. He has a purpose and a plan that will fulfill our lives if we will trust him. We can bring hope to this world, but only after we understand it ourselves. That hope belongs to us. And once we have it, I don't believe you can live your life in that without sharing it, without being excited by it, and wanting to share with the world that good news. Paul says in this scripture that it's possible that we can be filled with the fullness of God. We can have spiritual maturity where we can find happiness and feel complete in our faith in God. It doesn't mean that life is going to come to us without struggles or trials. That's not promised to any of us. But it does mean that we have the help to deal with whatever life brings. Whether it's struggles or trials or temptation, God is with us through the Holy Spirit, helping us to deal with those things. And it gives to us the strength to deal with life with purpose and meaning. How many of us long for that? To know that our life means something, that we have a purpose, we're not just here. And I'm not talking about a glimpse of those things just once in a while, but I'm talking about living your life, knowing that you're called to serve the Lord, knowing that you have a purpose and a reason to get up in the morning and that you make a difference. What a blessing that is. 
Understand that God wants to give you that blessing as much as you want to receive it. Christ wants to come and to dwell in your heart. And it's not just a matter of stopping by for a visit on Sunday. God wants to take up residence in your heart. He wants to love you and lead you and guide you to give you peace, to give you purpose by sharing that love with a world that needs to hear it. For some, the thought of that may not be actually pleasant. You think that I'm telling you, well, God's gonna tell me I can't do this and I shouldn't do that. And here's a list of things that I shouldn't be involved in. God is not saying that because he wants to be a burden to you. He's telling you that because he wants to give you a better way of living. To show you a different approach to life and to give you a joy that the impact of a life that is lived for him can have not only on those you come in contact with, but with you as well. Once the Lord comes into your life and takes charge, you'll lose interest in the things that he doesn't want you to be a part of. They won't be as glamorous to you as you might think. And he wants to be a blessing in your life. So he will take those things that he doesn't want you to be involved in and he will bless you with the joy that comes with serving him and loving him and turning your interest to the things that he wants to give you. Paul closes this chapter with this magnificent doxology. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What an amazing declaration. That God is able and willing and wanting to do more for us than we can even imagine him doing in our life. We could sit down and write a list of things right now and they would not measure up to what God wants to do in your life. We live in this world with restrictions. We have limitations in this world that we won't have once we come to heaven. But while we're here, God has greater plans than we realize. He wants us to live in the fullness of God. What could be higher than the fullness of God? Paul says, don't limit yourself. Too often we fail to see what we could accomplish or what we could overcome. And we don't do it because we don't trust or obey. And all the time the Holy Spirit is in our life yelling at us, Trust me, I will help you to do this. I'm calling you to do this. Believe in me. Paul wrote to the Philippians in the fourth chapter, the 13th verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need to open our hearts to that. To hear his call and to be willing to answer We need to pray large prayers and we need to trust a God who is able to do much more than we can even imagine. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for you. There is joy in finding that plan and that purpose and serving the Lord. And he wants you to find that and have that. He'll give it to you. He won't keep it from you. In the sixth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah is writing about a time of trouble in the land. A good king, King Uzziah, had died, and Isaiah worried about the future of the kingdom. So what did God do for Isaiah? He gave to him a vision of God sitting on the throne with the seraphim around him crying, holy, holy, holy. 
God is still sitting on that throne. He is still in charge. His vision for us will bring to us peace and hope if we will open our hearts to it. God's desire is that we will. We need to do it as the family of God, reaching out in his name, making a difference as he leads us. We'll find the peace and fulfillment that God wants to bring in our lives when we open our hearts to him. We will find what a good and caring master he is. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, too often we live and come short of your glory. We hold back on the things that you would have us to do and we limit our faith. When you are ready and willing, Lord, to bring to us strength and hope, to give us plans, to give us a future, to fill us, Lord, with joy in serving you, a purpose that will not be denied. Lead us, O oh Lord, to trust more, to reach out more, and to do more in your kingdom, that we may know that joy and that we may share it. You're a good and gracious God who loves us abundantly. May we accept and believe that and do your work in this world. This we pray. Amen.